You have zero chance of making any money in wholesale if you aren't writing offers. Hi, I'm Jamil Damji, subject matter expert for wholesale and America's number one wholesaler. So you've been researching wholesaling and you've probably learned that you need to write offers on properties if you hope to get anything under contract so that you can make some money. However, it can be really confusing knowing what type of offers to write, who writes the offers, and what the differences are between the certain types of contracts. In this video, we're gonna dive into the different types of offers, who writes them, and I'll also have contracts that you'll need in the description so you won't have to go searching the internet for a good one. Now guys, I've spent thousands of dollars on an attorney creating these contracts for me and for you. So the law of reciprocity says that you should probably hit like right now and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. It's the right thing to do. All right, let's dive in. The first thing that's important to establish is where you're generating leads. Are you going direct to seller or are you working direct to agent? Let's start with direct to seller. This means that you're working directly with a homeowner to get a potential house under contract. In this instance, you will need to provide the contract as most homeowners won't have access to such a document. This document is referred to as the AB contract. The AB contract is between two parties, A and B. A being the seller and B being the buyer. That's you, your name or your entity. This contract should be pretty simple and it shouldn't be written in language that could be confusing to you or the seller because many contracts are written this way and I can tell you it can blow deals up. Typically the AB contract is very straightforward and it will spell out the following. The date the agreement was made, the parties to the contract, the legal description and address of the subject property, the purchase price, earnest money amount, title and escrow company and or the closing attorney handling the conveyance, the party's responsibilities, inspection time, financing conditions, close date, and any other terms or conditions that you or the seller agree to. This document will also have language spelling out what should happen if one or more parties breach the agreement and what remedies are appropriate should this happen. You need to familiarize yourself with this document, so I highly suggest that you read the entire thing line by line so that you understand exactly what you're getting yourself into. Also note that the contract that I provide you has language allowing for assignability and a unilateral cancellation clause. Both of these are very important if you ever want to sign your contract over to another buyer or cancel your contract and get your EMD back. Now, let's look at a direct-to-agent lead. This is actually a much easier process for you because typically, real estate agents that you're working with will always prepare the contract for you. In fact, real estate agents are required to use their board-approved contracts, and every state will have a different contract. So, if you're working in multiple markets, it's really important that you also read the entire document before you sign it. I can't stress this enough. I've received thousands of DMs from people saying, Jamil, I signed a contract and now I'm in trouble. I owe this money. I'm being threatened to be sued. I don't know what to do. I've missed my inspection date. I'm scared. Please, 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 guys, don't put yourself in a bad spot. Just read the agreement and understand what your responsibilities are. Again, this document will typically spell out the date the agreement was made, who the parties of the contract are, the legal description or the address of the property, the purchase price, earnest money amount, title and escrow company or closing attorney that's handling the conveyance, each party's responsibilities, the inspection time, financing contingencies, and the close date. It'll also have sections outlining the real estate agent's information and brokerage, and it'll state what agent is representing who in the transactions. I've done a video on agency relationships in the past, so if you're wondering about this, make sure you check that video out as well to gain some clarity. Something else to take note of is that most realtor-provided residential real estate contracts have language regarding assignability, so make sure that you read it to find out if the contract is or isn't assignable. Lastly, it's important to read the cancellation language should you decide to cancel for whatever reason you always want to make sure that you have what's called a unilateral cancellation clause in your contract. This will keep a seller from holding your EMD hostage if they get upset about you canceling the contract for whatever reason. It's not often that a seller will behave this way, but it happens. So it's better to be preemptively prepared by having this clause in your contract. Real estate agents will also have a slew of other boilerplate documents for you to sign that include, but aren't limited to, a lead-based paint disclosure, affiliated business disclosures, wire fraud disclosures, pool disclosures, commission instructions, agency declarations, and buyer broker agreements, and so on. 
These documents are typically standard and they protect the real estate agent against being sued should you decide to make a sandwich out of the lead-based paint that's inside of a property and eat it. Believe me, there wouldn't need to be a document disclosing this if a lawsuit hadn't happened in the past. Make sure you're paying close attention to commission's instructions as well to confirm that the seller is responsible for paying the real estate agent's commission and not the buyer. Sometimes a crafty real estate agent will slide in an additional commission instruction and have the buyer responsible for additional commission if they think they can get away with it. So make sure you're, you're watching for commission instructions. Also, pay attention to buyer broker agreements. Agents will love to get you to sign what's called a six month blanket buyer broker agreement, which means that they get to make money on any deal that you do for the next six months. Crazy, right? Now, again, real estate agents don't have you sign this because they're mean or weird people. They're typically used to the retail world. Now, what ends up happening in the retail world is a real estate agent could be driving around a buyer looking at house after house after house. And then a buyer could just find another house on Zillow and decide to go work with another agent after someone else had spent months showing them properties. So these six month buyer broker agreements are made to protect the agent from having their time wasted. However, because you're an investor and because you plan to do voluminous activity, it's very easy to explain to an agent that you can only sign what's called a property specific buyer broker agreement. This just means that the real estate agent is entitled to get paid a commission should you do a deal on this specific property and it has to be associated with that address. And this will just solve any problems that you might have in the future. Next, if you're planning to wholesale the contract, you're gonna need what's called an assignment contract. If you plan to double close, you're gonna need what's called a BC contract. Let's look at both of these. The assignment contract assigns your rights to purchase a contract to another entity, usually for a fee. The key to understand here is that you need to know that you're transferring your rights to someone else. So make sure that you've vetted your buyer before you hand over your deal to somebody else in case this knucklehead decides to tie up your deal and not close. This could ruin the entire deal and your relationships with the agents, buyers, and all other kinds of people involved. So don't put yourself in this legal pickle jar and make sure that you vet your buyers. In the case of selling using a double escrow or pass-through funding like transactional funding, the BC contract is simply the exact same contract as the AB contract, except the parties are different. In the BC contract, B is still you or your entity. Now you're the seller and C is the new buyer that you're selling to. So now that you have some clarity on an AB contract, an assignment contract, a BC contract, and when to use them all, it's time for you to get your butt off of YouTube and to go onto the phones and start prospecting. But if you decide you wanna hang out on YouTube still, you should watch this next video because there's a ton of information there that's gonna help you along in your journey. These houses aren't gonna lock themselves up, guys, so go get to work. I'll see you in the next one.